Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting and educational TIES webinar. We are excited to have Adrienne Mayer here. And the reason why we have her here is because I listened to a 10 hour audiobook, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, with Steve Brusetti. And in it, he mentioned twice that indigenous people of South America and North America contributed to discovering dinosaurs. And I had never really thought about that. So after I got done with that book, I said, I need to find an expert on who knows the story because it should be told. And because we supply resources to K through 12 teachers, one of the things that we often get asked is, can you have more resources that are inclusive of the scientists who are contributing to evolution? And with that, I found aging. So Adrian's gonna do a presentation on the indigenous Americans contributions to paleontology. And then after that, if you have questions, type them in the chat box below. I'm gonna talk a little bit about ties after her presentation and then I'm gonna, then we can ask the expert after that. Thank you. Um, I'm really delighted and honored to be invited to the ties webinar series uh, to talk about indigenous people's fossil discoveries. Um, some of the information comes from my book, Fossil Legends, The First Americans, and my research for that book was based on an obvious but unacknowledged fact. Cencer centuries before the arrival of Europeans and long before the development of the formal science of paleontology in the late 19th century, indigenous people in the Americas uh, had already observed and speculated about the fossilized traces of extinct life forms. Uh, they saw fossil shells and fish and other marine species uh, in arid terrains and on mountaintops, and they understood that the land had once been under the sea. And of course, they also encountered petrified wood from ancient forests, and uh, as well as the huge bones of dinosaurs and mammoths and other traces of vanished creatures. And their interpretations of the fossils uh, the ways they accounted uh, for uh, uh, the petrified shells, bones, and dinosaur tracks are fascinating examples of pre-Darwinian geomythology. And now, so their inter interpretations of, of the fossils um, uh, are fascinating examples of what is uh, called geomythology. And so this is uh, pre-Darwinian geomythology. And geomyths are legends about remarkable natural phenomena from earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis and floods to fossils of long extinct uh, creatures. And these stories about observed fossils represent the first inklings of the scientific impulse. If you think about it, such stories can contain observations and some perceptive insights about natural evidence that are actually of great interest to scientists and historians today. And when I began my research, I noticed that almost every natural history museum, whether it's large or small, uh, displays fossils uh, from tiny shells and petrified wood to huge bones of mammoths and dinosaurs. And these very same museums also display artifacts from Native American cultures. And here I'll just uh, note how very strange it is for museums to treat indigenous peoples as a kind of natural history like uh, flora and fauna. But anyway, when you go to a natural history museum, you walk through the great exhibit halls and marveling uh, and learning a lot about the stupendous skeletons of long extinct animals. Then in other rooms, you stand before some glass cases full of artifacts uh, and uh, life experiences of the very people who lived among those same huge fossils and observed them over thousands of years. And yet most museum curators, uh, historians and paleontologists themselves never make that obvious connection between fossils and the indigenous people who actually knew them best over so many more generations than, than uh, the Europeans who came over uh, only about oh, only a few hundred years ago. And this is especially ironic, I think, in places where there are really impressive 
dinosaur remains and uh, bones of mammoths and other megafauna, these bones weather out constantly from bare hills and ravines and riverbanks. And the conspicuous bones would have been familiar to many different native groups. Now, there are some exceptions uh, to uh, museums ignoring this. The Journey Museum in Rapid City, South Dakota, um, Agate Springs National Monument in Nebraska. Those two museums, I think, were among the very first to include Native American interpretations of local dinosaur and uh, other megafauna fossils. And this is, uh, this is just a bison hide calendar that shows fossil events and actually creation of fossils at Agate Springs, Nebraska. It's prominently displayed uh, in their museum in, in Nebraska made by Dawn Little Sky, who's shown there on the right. And in October last year, 2022, the exhibit being legendary by the famous Canadian Cree artist, uh, Kent Monkman opened at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And the artist uh, explores the deep roots of indigenous knowledge about, uh, about uh, the Cree land and the land of other uh, Native yeah. Americans in that region and the fossils they observed. And he uh, illustrates and retells some of the stories that they uh, created to a, a attempt to account for those remarkable remains. Uh, the catalog to that uh, exhibit is really quite amazing. Most historians of science have simply assumed that oral traditions about Native American fossil discoveries were lost long ago and could never be uh, recovered now. But there's another very important reason why Native Americans and First, First uh, Nations people have not been included in the official history of paleontology. And I'm gonna name names here. Uh, George Gaylord Simpson was considered the most influential paleontologist of modern times. And in his definitive history of fossil discoveries in North America, uh, first published in 1943, this eminent historian, unfortunately, he went out of his way to declare that Native Americans played no role and contributed nothing to what he called the true discoveries of important fossils. And here's just a few quotes from his work. He stated that Indians rarely took notice of fossils, uh, even in the most conspicuous and abundant bone beds of North America. And if they ever did collect fossils, Simpson said it was only out of idle curiosity. He claimed that indigenous people were unable to recognize fossils as the organic traces of past life. And he suggested that studying Native American discoveries should be avoided as, as worthless. He says that the temptation to consider them uh, in more detail must be resisted. And with these arguments, George Gaylord Simpson was strongly refuting a suggestion by a Canadian paleontologist named Edward Kindle. Edward Kindle is not as famous uh, or as productive as Simpson, but um, in 1935, he was the first modern scientist to suggest that First Nations Native Americans should be credited with significant fossil discoveries. And this he wrote in a brief paper in the Journal of Paleontology. And in his paper, Kindle pointed out that First Nations people had long observed and speculated about dinosaur and mammoth and other fossils in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, uh, and uh, of course, uh, other places in the Americas. And he noted that the first European descriptions of those fossils uh, were actually made possible by First Nations guides. Kindle noted, for example, that when Henry Hind uh, explored Manitoba in 1858, he spoke with many different Canadian native people about extraordinary skeletons in the land. And, and the people who uh, were arriving from Europe at that time uh, uh, needed guides and asked uh, local people to take them to see fossils. Uh, Heinz reports documented some of the earliest fossil discoveries and accounts by native Canadians, including Blackfeet, Assiniboine, Metis, and Ojibwe uh, Anishinaabe people. And here are some of his drawings and paintings uh, made by Henry Hind. Um, for example, native people, local people told Hind about the giant bones of a great spirit monster 
that were revealed in a landslide on the Shell River, a branch of the Assiniboine River in Manitoba. Uh, Hind also examined huge teeth and a massive shoulder blade that Matisse uh, native traders brought to Fort Pelly in 1854. They knew it was important and they brought it to show the soldiers at Fort Pelly. Uh, First Nations people guided Hind to the sites of other immense skeletons still in the ground. Now, one of these was eventually excavated and transported to the British Museum, where it was later identified as uh, the remains of a mammoth. Hind also recorded his conversations with Tawa Pete, a uh, First Nations elder whose tribe often visited the Valley River to gather salt. Um, that's where they gathered minerals and they collected gigantic petrified bones, which they ground up for medicine. That was a, a, a practice that uh, appears around the world uh, when people find fossil bones. Um, the Indians camped near Lake Dauphin and they told Hind that Riding Mountain, where they also went to gather clay for their pipes and other uh, um, artifacts, uh, they said that that area was haunted by what they called monsters. They showed Hind the teeth and they drew pictures of the skeletons for him. And uh, later, uh, those, photo, uh, those drawings uh, indicated that um, the bones belonged to mammoths. And accounts like these show that petrified remains of unfamiliar creatures are they're intriguing objects that have demanded explanation and they've stimulated speculation since ancient times. But George Gaylord Simpson declared that all indigenous fossil discoveries were, quote, casual finds without any scientific sequel, unquote. And they deserve no place in the history of, quote, true discovery. And with that, George Gaylord Simpson effectively silenced the early, earlier exchanges between Native Americans and Euro-Americans about the fossil records. So Simpson's pronouncements and his publications are a major reason why native encounters with fossils are so little known today. And his point of view prevailed for a long time among scientists and historians. And uh, some decades ago, I made it my mission to take up Edward Kindle's suggestion and prove Simpson wrong on all counts. Uh, Obviously, people have observed, measured, collected, used, and attempted to account for remarkable fossils over millennia and all around the world. And I demonstrated just how ancient that curiosity and those perceptive insights about fossils are in my book, The First Fossil Hunters, about Greek and Roman ideas and discoveries of fossils and their uh, insights into extinction, evolution, and deep time. This is something that really interested Georges Cuvier, the father of paleontology in about 1800. For my book, Fossil Legends of the First Americans, it took years of collecting fossil related material from colonial era written sources from folklore collections, collections of oral traditions, uh, some written archives, uh, photographs and interviews. I found that the Spanish explorers such as Cortez and Acosta in Mexico and South America were the first to record indigenous Aztec, Maya, and Inca accounts of large vertebrate fossils. And these ancient oral traditions were preserved in Spanish in the writings of the 1500s to the 1700s. At that time, Europeans thought that large fossils must be the giant victims of Noah's flood. Um, they found that the indigenous Americans explained the bones as enormous creatures of long ago ages, uh, that were either defeated by uh, their ancestors or had died out due to some catastrophe. Over several seasons, I drove about 8,000 miles around the Western United States talking with Native American storytellers, elders, 
um, spiritual leaders, teachers, and ordinary people on reservations near major fossil bone beds. And I just was asking if they might remember hearing any stories, oral traditions about the fossils from their grandparents or even earlier. And I was able to gather oral and written accounts about fossil legends from more than 45 different native cultures in over 30 states. Um, in the US, Canada, and Mexico. My book was published in 2005, but that was just the beginning. And I'm happy to say that now uh, others are beginning to gather fossil knowledge and geomythology about fossils in Africa, India, China, and Australia. And my project, I want to say, would have been impossible without the generous help of many Native Americans who shared old oral traditions about fossils. In the Americas, the extraordinary bones, the tracks, and other traces of colossal, unfamiliar animals were not only noticed, but they came to have deep cultural meanings uh, to the indigenous peoples. I've already mentioned some early Canadian examples of people who discovered and described large vertebrate fossils um, and guided Europeans. Um, and now I just want to mention a few more in Canada. The world's richest dinosaur site is around the Red Deer River in Alberta, where immense fossils are ubiquitous and conspicuous to any passersby as they erode out of the landscape. Before the scientific excavations of these spectacular dinosaur remains, by William Dawson and Joseph Tyrell in 1884, the French explorer Jean Leroux had lived with Blackfoot and other bands of uh, first uh, peoples in uh, Alberta from 1860 to 1890. And here he is with uh, some of his friends. He wrote that his friends collected pigments and other minerals in dinosaur fossil beds, and they honored the earth spirits at the Red Deer River. They showed him many colossal bones of mysterious, powerful animals that they had never seen alive. They called these creatures the grandfathers of the buffalo and left offerings of cloth and tobacco at those sites. These are some of the uh, impressive fossils from Alberta. As the Canadian paleontologist uh, David Spaulding points out, the Blackfoot interest was spiritual and was practical but they recognized the massive bones of huge hadrosaur, triceratops, ankylosaur, and other dinosaurs, theropods, as creatures that had once lived and then died out in ages past. And they uh, assumed that they were, these uh, bones represented the ancestors of living animals that they saw today, uh, and some uh, that they didn't recognize, they called spirit monsters. In the late 19th uh, century, pioneer paleo paleontologists such as Edward Drinker Cope, the Sternbergs, um, O.C. Marsh, and many other fossil hunters began to travel to the American West in, in search of impressive fossils for the, all the big museums in the East. They relied of course, on local Indian scouts to guide them to the fossil beds. And reading through their archives and uh, notebooks, to my great surprise, I discovered that it was rare for these scientists to ever discuss the meaning of the fossils with their Indian escorts, the people most familiar with the remains. And the scientists hardly ever preserved the names of the scouts whose knowledge of the fossil sites was so essential to their discoveries for the museums in the East. I spent a lot of time searching for this missing material and looking for names and photographs in the archives and field notes and uh, correspondence. Now, O.C. Marsh of Yale was an exception in the late 19th century. Marsh did public, uh, publicly acknowledge the help of the Oglala Sioux chiefs, Red Cloud, American Horse, and Little Wound in Dakota, uh, Dakota Territory in South Dakota. Um, these men helped him find the fossil deposits. Um, the fossils they knew so well in the land all ended up in the Yale Peabody Museum. Um, unfortunately, their help is not mentioned in the museum uh, labels uh, today, um, even though O.C. Marsh thanked them in his books. 
I made a special effort to try to recover the names of Indian fossil guides who had helped other famous pioneer paleontologists. And sometimes I was lucky to find rare photographs of scouts who did guide the fossil expeditions in the West. Um, here's an example for um, John Wesley Powell and uh, a, a Ute leader uh, in 1873 um, in the Grand Canyon and Petrified Forest region of Arizona and New Mexico. Um, this is White Bear, uh, uh, a crow uh, man who uh, guided the fossil expeditions in 1884. Uh, um, undertaken by William Berryman Scott and his Princeton team. Um, they hired him at Fort Custer, Montana. Um, and when I only learned their guide's name uh, from Scott's uh, handwritten field notes and found a photograph in, in the archives uh, of his team. Um, and here uh, we have uh, Alec Mousseau, a Lakota scout who guided uh, the famous paleontologist John Bell Hatcher and again, William Berry, Berryman Scott, both of Princeton University. Um, Alec Mousseau led their group of Princeton students to the fossil beds of the South Dakota Badlands in 1890. And that was the summer before the Wounded Knee Massacre at Pine Ridge. And again, I found the guide's name uh, penciled on the back of this photograph in the Princeton archives in the rare book uh, rooms at Princeton Firestone Library. This is Silas Fills the Pipe, a Lakota man who was the fossil guide for several paleontologists in the South Dakota Badlands beginning in the 1920s. Uh, he showed them the locations of significant bone beds. And again, his photo was very deep in the archives and, and field notes of those uh, expeditions. First Nations, uh, Native Americans had keenly observed fossil remains over many generations, and they thought rationally about their meaning. Contrary to what George Gaylord Simpson claimed, many of their insights uh, and explanations were sophisticated and quite perceptive. Their uh, creation stories uh, often referred to enormous bones, stone shells, and dinosaur tracks in bedrock, in bedrock and they show that they did recognize these fossils as organic, as extinct life forms from the deep past. And they also valued fossils for cultural and practical uses. Uh, we know that in Kansas and Nebraska, Native Americans collected uh, mammoth uh, and dinosaur fossils for various uses, including medicine. They often chose fossils for their tools or uh, ornaments or decorations or uh, for their medicine pouches. And there has been recently found evidence that they collected dinosaur scoots or the scales, large scales from armored dinosaurs uh, in order to roast pine nuts. Uh, uh, and they work perfectly as a riddle for roasting foods. And they considered the extraordinary mineralized remains of past creatures and plants to be important records of the Earth's history, uh, records of past flora and fauna, uh, also records of floods, fires, and other geological events. And uh, they understood the concept of extinction. There's no question that they made contributions to the history of paleontology. Some of their traditions even anticipated uh, modern uh, scientific knowledge and concepts of extinction, evolution, and deep time. Centuries before Europeans began to replace their belief in the biblical Noah's Ark story with scientific understandings of evolution, indigenous people had already recognized that some species had vanished altogether, never to be seen again, or that they had somehow become smaller over time. When indigenous people came across fossils that uh, the skeletons uh, resemble the forms of familiar animals, but they were of ast uh, astonishing magnitude, uh, much larger than, uh, than the familiar animal that they knew, the discoveries seemed to confirm the elder stories about grandfathers of the buffalo, grandfathers of the beaver, of the bear, of the elk and eagle of long ago times. For example, an Iroquois tradition 
tells of a young boy who took his tribe to see the skeleton of an immense grandfather of the bear. Um, the elders examined the giant bones and recognized this beast as a gigantic bear. And they also imagined that this animal was an extremely fast runner. And stories arose about uh, hero boy, uh, young boys who raced the great bear uh, in the olden days. They told stories about this fast running gigantic bear. Um, and in that area, uh, of upstate New York, uh, paleontologists, paleontologists do find remains of the giant short-faced bear. And here uh, up on the upper left, you can see uh, a comparison of the skull of the giant short-faced bear next to a grizzly skull. These were massive bears. Uh, from the Pleistocene, much larger than the grizzly. And the Iroquois elders had also noted its impressively long legs, relatively long legs for uh, a bear. Um, and the paleontologists today believe that this bear uh, was capable of great running speeds. Giant beavers figure in stories across North America, um, stories inspired by the discoveries of huge fossils of the giant beaver of the Ice Age. This Pleistocene beaver was as large as a black bear and its front teeth were half a foot long. Native Americans recognized the fossils as those of the long ago ancestor of today's beaver. They called uh, these, uh, these beavers the, gr the grandfather of the beaver. Micmac and other tribes collected the teeth of the giant beaver and use them as tools to hollow out their log canoes. Many stories described uh, buffalo of terrific size. In 1766, for example, I learned that an Iroquois chief who was 84 at the time recited an oral tradition told by his great, great grandparents about the creation of the grandfather of the buffalo uh, long ago. And then, uh, in his story, to ensure the safety of human hunters, small puny human hunters, uh, compared to this gigantic buffalo, um, the creator then sent uh, tremendous bolts of lightning to destroy these dangerous beasts, uh, making it safer for, uh, for human hunters and leaving their massive bones in the earth. For proof of this story, people pointed to the fossil remains of mastodons, mammoths, and the supersized bison latifrons and bison antiquus, uh, whose horn tips span six feet, extinct giant bison. Um, the oldest version of the grandfather of the buffalo tradition has some geographic and historical details that suggest an origin in about 1500. It's um, interesting to me that uh, many paleontologists still do rely on Native Americans to help them find and understand fossil locations. Uh, in Arizona, for example, these Navajo tra trackers recently discovered and were able to trace the path, uh, sort of uh, uh, like a dotted line, uh, it would disappear and then they would find it again trace the path of an extensive dinosaur trackway that was made by a Dilophosaurus dinosaur in Arizona. The most famous specimen of this particular uh, dinosaur was discovered by a, a Navajo man named Jesse Williams in 1940. Um, and that specimen discovered by Jesse Williams was then excavated by uh, the paleontologist Sam Wells, a uh, famous paleontologist at Berkeley, who him, he himself took credit for the discovery. Wells removed the skeleton from the reservation uh, to Berkeley, California, um, where it still is on display. I think it's rather amusing uh, to, to read his notes here. Uh, he, he heard about this uh, dinosaur uh, uh, fossil skeleton uh, discovered by uh, the Navajo Jesse Williams, uh, and he tried to find it and he failed. So he had to find Jesse uh, uh, 
Williams uh, who guided him to the site. And it's amusing to see that Wells himself was uh, celebrated for his own amazing ability to locate dinosaur fossils. Uh, Wells was famous for his field work, uh, finding fossils where no one else ever could. Today, there are more enlightened paleontologists who work in partnership uh, with Native Americans and uh, actually respect their knowledge and traditions about fossil dinosaur remains in their lands. In the United States, um, for the first time now, the, Depart the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service both are now headed by Native Americans. Deb Holland, a Laguna Pueblo, uh, is the head of the Department of the Interior. And Charles Sams, a KU Walla Walla, Native American was appointed in 2021 to head the National Park Service. And in the US uh, National Park Service, Vincent Santucci, a paleontologist uh, at the Park Service, and his colleagues at White Sands National Park, New Mexico, they work and consult with Native American tribes uh, in that region uh, to understand the numerous trackways of prehistoric animals alongside recently discovered footprints of paleo Indians, something that was a very exciting discovery to see that uh, human beings actually uh, made tracks uh, alongside the megafauna from the late Pleistocene and early Holocene. Another uh, good example of partnership is the Zuni Ceratops dinosaur, which was discovered a few years near ago near um, Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. Uh, the paleontologist Douglas Wolf named the new species in honor of the Zuni creation myth, which contains accurate understandings of primeval geological history, evolution, and extinction in, in the region uh, where where Zuni uh, people help Doug Wolf to find these uh, fabulous fossils. So J, uh, George Gaylord Simpson was uh, obviously wrong to deny Native Americans a place in the history of paleontology. First Nations Native American discoveries, they helped to bring major fossil beds to the attention of science and their traditional explanations often expressed in mythic terms, but they're based on careful observations of geological evidence over time. They can uh, contain many details that are recognizable uh, by scientists today uh, of keen observation. Many fossil legends evoke a sense of deep time and an idea of successive ages or eons, um, each one marked by different climate, different landforms, uh, different uh, flora and different creatures. Um, and each age ended and then the next age begins. Um, and many of those stories also propose uh, rational or logical scenarios for catastrophic extinction. I think I have time for just a few uh, also related uh, oral traditions. Um, before I wrap up, the Canadian Blackfoot storyteller Percy Bullchild uh, re recounted his tribe's traditional explanation for dinosaur fossils in Alberta and northern Montana in this way. Quote, the first creatures in these lands were many kinds of reptiles. Some had legs, some were more like serpents. They grew and grew until they became much overgrown. They were very tall and very long. Then great floods and mudslides and avalanches destroyed these gigantic reptiles. Some were covered with mud so fast that we can sometimes find their whole bodies in the ground, unquote. And indeed in Blackfoot uh, lands, and um, I don't know if I need to reshare or can't seem to get to the next. There we go. Um, indeed in Blackfoot lands, some dinosaur skeletons are actually found nearly complete and some 
dinosaur skeletons are actually mummified. The whole body is there with internal organs, uh, stomach contents, and skin. These images uh, show a 20 foot long mummified hadrosaur dinosaur and an armored ankylosaurus, uh, both discovered in Blackfeet territory in Northern Montana and Alberta in that region. Um, the Assiniboine Nakota Sioux, who lived in Alberta and Northern Montana, not far from where these finds occurred, also recounted fossil related stories. Um, I talked with the spiritual healer, John Allen, uh, on, on the uh, Assiniboine Reservation in northern Montana, and he shared an old oral tradition passed down by his mother, Minerva Allen, and she heard it as a little girl from her grandfather, who had heard it from the old medicine man named Coming Day. And here I found a photo of Coming Day, um, another uh, Native American on the reservation happened to have a photo of coming day who told this story. This uh, photo was taken about 1920. A very long time ago, his story begins, an Assiniboine war party traveled a very long distance and encountered a giant lizard in some barren hills. They held a council and discussed what they knew about these strange creatures. They agreed to leave this great reptile alone, just leave it in the ground. But one young man wanted to win honor. He bragged that he wasn't afraid to attack the monster. He charged the giant lizard and tried to run it through with his lance. But the creature's hide was like rock and the young warrior lost his life. This, uh, is a very stripped down, compressed version told over many, many retellings. Um, it was once probably a very exciting native story, uh, narrative story told by elders on long winter nights. There must have been further details. Um, John Allen pointed out a few details that help us to date this story. Lances, for instance were very old weapons. They were used uh, by soldiers on foot or hunters on foot, and they were used before the Assiniboine uh, had acquired horses. So that detail um, points to uh, a time when the Assiniboine were migrating west. They traveled a very long distance barren hills. They were migrating west to Alberta and Montana before they had horses. So that would have been uh, between 1600 and 1700. And the giant lizard with a hide like so stone, that really sounds like a, a way of a mythological way of describing a well-preserved dinosaur skeleton. Perhaps they came across a mummified body emerging from uh, eroding out of a cliffside. Uh, like the hadrosaur in the in the previous slide. Another account comes from Arizona, and it's recounted uh, in the autobiography of Geronimo, the famous Apache leader born in 1829. And I did not uh, discover this story myself. It was sent to me by a third grader and his father, who had been reading uh, Geronimo's biography, autobiography, and they came across this story and sent it to me. So I'm very grateful to that third grade in uh, Arizona who sent me this story. Geronimo begins uh, with his tribe's creation story. In the beginning, the world was dark and there were many terrible lizard-like monsters. These creatures of land made war on the giant creatures of the sky. Some of the monsters were too wily and wise to be killed in these cosmic battles, however. They took refuge on high cliffs in the mountains and in the deserts of Arizona. When they died, their eyes turned into the brilliant stones that you can see embedded in the rocks of the desert. One of these huge beasts, covered with layers and layers of tough scales, that, that monster was invincible. Arrows could not penetrate its hide. 
This monster lived on top of a very steep cliff in the desert. It was finally killed by a young Apache hero uh, from the Apache epic poems. With a tremendous roar, the monstrous scaly lizard rolled down the precipice of the cliff into the deep canyon below. And then a terrific thunderstorm swept over the mountain with lightning and driving rain. After the storm, the people could see far down in the canyon below the immense body of the monster at the bottom of the cliff. This Apache legend narrated by Geronimo in 1906 in his autobiography arose from observations of enormous bones of an armored dinosaur. Uh, they mentioned that he has a scale, that it had, the monster has scales. Um, and the bones were found at the base of a very high cliff. This is exactly where paleontologists look for dinosaur fossils today. Enormous skulls and bones of massive reptiles, dinosaurs of the Jurassic and Cretaceous epochs, continually weather out of eroding cliff faces and gullies in the deserts of Arizona and New Mexico, and in the Badlands of the Western in Canada and the US. And the skeletons of dinosaurs are often revealed um, by the erosion caused by fierce thunderstorms, just as in the Apache tradition. Geronimo says that a very severe storm with lightning and thunder made the monster's body invisible. Well, to conclude, I, I'd like to think that if George Gaylord Simpson uh, were still alive today, I think he'd have to change his mind. I hope he would be convinced that First Nations and Native American fossil knowledge should be included in the history of paleontology, uh, in the history of our human desire to understand the Earth's past. And we now have a chance to make sure uh, that the erasure of all the Indian guides and their names and their images who were so crucial to early paleontological expeditions, uh, along with the failure to record indigenous insights about fossils, and the removal of valuable fossil resources from reservation lands, we can now uh, have a chance to make sure that uh, those events are relics of an unenlightened past. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions if I can. Wonderful. Thank you, Adrian. That was very fascinating. And Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but first I just want to tell the people about ties. So ties, Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. We are here for teachers and we're all, we're made from teachers. We have a website, tieseducation.org. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. And just a few months ago, I created a YouTube page where all of our webinars and free resources are archived. So you can go back there and check them out. And all of the resources are vetted by teachers. And that's where we get the resources from. Teachers send us things that work in their classroom. If you liked this webinar for the second semester of the school year, we have, I think, seven or eight more webinars coming up. And we have really great presenters. The topics are all over the place, but they're all evolution <laughs> themed, all science themed. and. Uh, I'm really excited to have them. Some of them are during the school day. And when that happens, they're definitely uh, school age appropriate. You can live stream them in your classroom. You're encouraged to. The students can participate. They can ask the expert. And then for the webinars that happen after school hours, the idea, the hope is that you play snippets of it or you assign some of them, some of those portions to your students. So they can also learn that Science and evolution is still happening today. All right, so on our website, like I was saying, our motto is teachers helping teachers. If you are a teacher and you've been teaching for one year or 32 years, like our director, uh, Bertha Vasquez, you probably have some experience with teaching evolution. And what we're looking for is maybe a couple of minutes, like a one minute or a three minute advice tip on how do you address common evolution misconceptions? How do you address the phrase theory? So evolution is a theory, but theories are not bad. 
so how do you address that? And then how do you make children comfortable who are told that evolution is against their religion? So if you have some tips on that, we welcome you to submit them on our website, tieseducation.org slash tips. And then our hope is that we create this little archive, a little video archive on YouTube for teachers looking for those answers. All of our resources are free. We have hands-on labs, we have digital labs, we have PowerPoints. And if we suggest a lab, it should only cost you probably $5 or less because we know the teachers are, have tight budgets these days. So everything is free. You might have to buy like M&Ms or chopsticks, but other than that, it's all free. And the only thing that we do sell is our book. It's called On Teaching Evolution. And I saw Patty here in the audience and she wrote a chapter as well as I did. And uh, the only reason why we sell the book is because we had to pay the publisher to print this very nice high quality book. But uh, today's near the end of January, don't buy it now. February 1st through February 15th, we're having our first ever sale on our book to celebrate Darwin's birthday and Valentine's Day. We are combining those two holidays. So if you love evolution, if you love teaching science, wait February 1st through the 15th, 2023. We're going to have a giant sale on our book. Now, we're part of the Center for Inquiry. Ties is part of it but we also have some other programs. One is Young Skeptics. The Young Skeptics program aims to develop and foster an understanding of the world through inquiry-based learning. So Young Skeptics is another program where we offer free resources for K through 12 teachers. And another program that's also about education is called Science Saves. And just like our other two programs, it was created by teachers for teachers. And these lessons promote the fact that thanks to science, individual lives are longer, healthier, easier, and fuller. Now, scientists look like Adrian, and they look like Steve uh, Brusetti from a, a week or two ago. Typically, biology students, or scientists rather, are not blowing things up. We do not like this logo or this image. So we have a little contest right now. We are trying to banish this stereotype of an old man with white hair blowing stuff up because that's not really what scientists do. So if you are a student, kindergarten all the way up to college and you can create a better logo by mid-February or first week of February, you can win $10,000. That is right, you can win $10,000. Go to sciencesaves.org uh, and then you can see our $10,000 image contest. And you can hopefully use that money for college or anything you want. Now, another uh, thing about Science Saves is in addition to just science lessons, we also have lessons for elementary, language arts, math, history, because science is part of all of those topics. And another contest that we are doing is for seniors in high school. So if you are teaching seniors in high school, they're entering college, we have a scholarship for them. For the next four years, and hopefully longer, we have secured funding to provide some scholarships and what they have to do, what the student has to do is make a 30 second video on how science has improved their life or somebody that they know. So it could be about how they have insulin. It could be about how they got a vaccine. It could be about how they have an artificial limb. It could be about how they take cough medicine and they could win $10,000 for college. That money can be used for textbooks to get to college. They could put it in a bank. They could put it in a mutual fund. They can do whatever they want with that money. So it will not affect their grants as they enter college. The deadline for that, by the way, is May 8th, which happens to be my birthday. <laughs> so it's easy to remember. All right, Adrian, we have a couple of questions for you. Okay. I will read them to you. I'm excited. All right, and also thank you everyone who attended live. All right, so Ariel says, have you heard of any dinosaurs or animal fossils discovered 
by the people of the Lumi Nation in Washington State or any Salish tribes? Not that I know of, but I'm sure they did. Is it fossiliferous? Is that an uh, area that ha has fossils? I do not know that, but that is something that I was thinking because I'm from Western New York, uh -huh. like Niagara Falls, New York. And then I was thinking, well, you have to be in a place where there's a lot of sedimentary rock and. That's right. If, if there's, uh, if there are the fossils for fossil legends to arise, fossils have to be conspicuous uh, to ordinary passers by. Um, that's one reason that um, pterosaur fossils aren't noticed, even though they're in Texas, they're very hard to find because they're deep in very hard rock. And so an ordinary person passing by something, uh, a, a fossil of uh, a partial fossil of a pterosaur or a um, uh, pterodactyl wouldn't notice it. Only a scientist would realize that what it what it was. So, I don't know of any um, stories from Salish or Lumi people. Um, but you might want to check if it's a fossiliferous area. Then you could go and start asking questions. <laughs> kind of related to that. Do you know how the third grader and father found you to share the Geronimo story? Uh, they had they had my book, the uh, Fossil Legends of the First Americans, um, and so then they found me through Stanford, I I, I believe, um, because of a website there at Stanford. Um, I I've also written that um, I co-authored a children's book called The Griffin and the Dinosaur, which is about you know the mythological griffin with a beak and four legs, uh, and how that might have been. Um, influenced uh, by uh, ancient discoveries of fossils of dinosaurs in Central Asia. And so I believe that um, they might have known about that book as well, uh, since he was a third grader. And that book is for grade school kids. Very good. And I will put that link in the video description. You yeah. have been at Stanford University since 2006, when you suggested you wanted to research indigenous people's contribution to paleontology and research folk science. What was the response? Did they think you would be able to find enough information to be worthwhile? Um, I arrived at Stanford uh, in 2006, but I started the work on that, uh, the research work on that in about 19... 95, uh, when I was an independent scholar, independent scientific uh, <laughs> a historian of science. Uh, so I was working on my own before the internet, before email. Um, and I hoped that it would be a project that, uh, that people would want to know about. But um, at that time, there was no one else working on that kind of thing. And my book proposal uh, was turned down by 14 publishers <laughs> before I finally was able to place it with Princeton University Press, which uh, had a very visionary editor. And so at the, I really was, I just continued working on it because it was so close to my heart. I really wanted to get that information out there. For students who are interested in learning and studying the history of science and the people who contributed that, what advice or experiences would you recommend they pursue? Maybe, maybe students who are like entering college, what, what should they look for? Oh, well, uh, museums are, are the place to go and just start talking to, start talking to the people who are, you know, uh, showing you around or uh, ask if you can meet with, if you're interested in fossils, at the museum, for uh, as I was at Museum of Rockies, Museum of the Rockies, for instance, in Bozeman, Montana, um, look up their website and look at their staff and send an email to them. And I think most most scientists at museums are really happy to talk to anyone who wants to talk to them about their specialty. And many museums also have outreach programs. I know that the Museum of the Rockies, a very famous dinosaur. Uh, um, collection there uh, 
they have outreach for anyone who's interested uh, on a deeper level. And they also have internships. So uh, always check with museums and talk with docents and curators and anyone you can find there and they'll help you. Great advice. And we talked earlier about Steve Brissetti and in his presentation afterwards, I said, all of these uh, people that are presenting for us in the second semester are authors. And I just reached to them, reached out to them, scientists, authors, and I said, hey, you know, talked a little bit about ties. And pe every single person who I asked said yes. And obviously, I work for the organization, but Steve was saying as a child, he would reach out to scientists, and almost all of them also would reply because they That's want right. to further their discipline and want people to be inspired. He reached out to me when he was in, I think he was in high school and he reached out to me and we started a correspondence that continues today. So um, I think most scientists are very eager to, to talk with anybody about their field and what, what you know, it's a passion for them. So uh, don't ever feel shy about talking to scientists about what they love to do. Yes, great advice. Also last week we had Kevin Hunt who studies chimps and we asked him how many people in the world study chimps in depth. And I think he said like 100, but really only like 40 who are really <laughs> active. So if you like chimps, those 40 people probably want to get more scientists. So we encourage Absolutely. It. Yeah, we encourage it. Michael says, wonderful talk, Adrian. What do you see as the next steps in furthering research knowledge on Indigenous Americans' contributions to not just paleontology, but to other disciplines, including things like art and design. And I'll add like medicine and other things like that. Well, a lot of people, remember I noted, I mentioned uh, that, um, that people used to collect bones and grind them up at, for medicine and make a tea or a soup out of medicine. People have asked me, well, wouldn't that be dangerous? Wouldn't that be bad? But it turns out that I've asked scientists and biologists about that uh, practice, which happens in not just in, uh, um, in the tribes that I mentioned in Nebraska and in Canada, uh, but also in there are uh, pharmacies in Mexico where they sell uh, mam ground mammoth bone medicine. And of course, in China, uh, they sell dragon bone medicine, which uh, which is uh, a tea, and it uh, it's calcium. So a calcium supplement would not hurt you. It would actually be a very healthy thing uh, to be eating. So there's that. But um, other uh, indigenous peoples' uh, knowledge uh, that goes back for generations. I I met and talked with some people at um, Cambridge University, uh, archaeo uh, astronomers who are very interested in Native American observations of the skies and celestial events that they recorded on their uh, um, bison hide calendars. And the Pawnee were especially interested in meteors and comets. They were obsessed with those and they recorded them going back generations. And these uh, these uh, modern astronomers are very interested in that field. So the, and that's a brand new field, archaeoastronomy. So uh, there's lots of possibilities. I went yeah. to Peru several years ago and uh -huh. I was there for two weeks. I did a three hour star watching, you know, event. And they talked about people from hundreds and hundreds of years ago and how they farmed and how they navigated. And that was the biggest highlight of the whole trip because right. it was so amazing that yes. they figured this out 700 years ago, a thousand years ago. Absolutely. Using it for navigation and uh, uh, when to plant. Um, yeah. And, uh, and if those are datable events, it's a, it's a great interest to, to scientists today to have those records. Same goes for flood, uh, you know, natural disasters like floods, earthquakes, and volcanoes. A lot of oral traditions that go back hundreds of years, even thousands of years, the oldest one we know of that is traced to datable event goes back more than 6,000 years ago. And it describes the creation of Crater Lake uh, in, in Oregon. Um, and it's got details that scientists today say that 
those details could not be there unless there was an eyewitness account. And so these geomyths, as they're termed, uh, can give us information about uh, natural disasters that are really important today. Yeah. All right, Adrian, we got two more questions, unless anybody else types another question. Do you think indigenous people's fossil findings influenced their seventh generation principle based on the ancient Iroquois philosophy that decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future? So do you think finding fossils help them realize their time in history and maybe project? That's a, that's a great uh, connection I, I hadn't thought of, but um, that's really interesting. I, um, they, they obviously have a sense of deep time and disasters and uh, um, climate change. Uh, they, they record these things in their in their oral traditions. And so I think that uh, finding the fossils definitely gave them a sense of a deep time extinction and things that could happen to different species uh, over time. So definitely, good question. One thing that we provide teachers with is that a lot of Europeans before Darwin thought that species were immutable, that means they thought species were there and they never changed. So what you're saying is probably the indigenous people saw giant bones and realized, hey, these animals aren't <laughs> existing anymore. Right, like the giant beaver, um, they recognize it as a beaver, but it's as big as a black bear and it's obviously a beaver. So uh, so grandfather of the beaver is, is correct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, the last question is from Gary. Are there any institutions that you know of which have set up special programs to train and assist indigenous students in working in the field of paleontology? Well, that's another interesting question. I don't know if, it, if this program would be specifically to, uh, to train uh, indigenous people as paleontologists, but I do know that a, a lot of Native Americans go into ge uh, geology um, because they really have respect for the land and uh, rocks and everything that is beloved in their, in their landscape. And so they like to learn about geology. Unfortunately, the, the jobs that they then are steered into are jobs finding oil and minerals and they uh, really don't want to work uh, in uh, jobs that 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 mean uh, ravaging the land or tearing uh, tearing into Mother Earth. And so I do know some um, people, who, uh, indigenous people, who have studied geology and then went into paleontology. I know uh, of at least two of them uh, who are now working as paleontologists. Also, um, I heard recently from. Uh, the Education Department of South Dakota that was creating uh, uh, courses and uh, curriculum for uh, reservation schools. Um, and they wanted to include oral traditions about fossils. And so I was helping them with that. And so hopefully some of those kids will become paleontologists. Very good. Thank you so much, Adrian Thank Mayer, you. for speaking with Ties today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Great yeah. questions.